All attempts in our world to change the rules so that people of God face a choice. Compromise or face the consequences.
Oh! 
It is well with my soul. Can you honestly say that this morning? If you can't yet, or maybe you've got mixed feelings about it yet, I'm hoping that by the end of our time together this morning, you really can. The worship team and the scriptures have already preached the sermon, so I'm just going to draw some threads together, and I'm, and I'm going to take from Nick's book and give you the snack rather than the full course meal. We're just going for the short, sharp, and shiny today. Um, I recognize that this series that we're going through has a lot in it, but I know a lot of you are doing it in the home groups, and so I want to leave some, I want to leave some cannon fodder for them. So uh, if you're doing it in the home group, you, you'll get the deeper version. But what I want to share with you is the, the key truths that we're discovering in this series as we work through our discipleship course. And we're calling the series, I Am. Huh? Who am I? Question mark. I, uh, uh, uh. The world's wondering who we are. Sometimes we wonder who we are. But um, we're, we're looking at how we re-anchor our foundations in a culture that is moving, as we heard earlier, far from where it used to be. How do we maintain and stay strong? How can we be followers of Jesus reaching the world without being shifted ourselves by the winds and the waves? And so... We're actually up to session two. It's taken us four weeks to get to session two. And one of the reasons we did that was um, the last three weeks we've been talking about our identity, who we are in Christ, and we discovered that we were accepted, that we were secure, and that we were significant. And that that comes from what Christ has done for us, in us, and through us. And so we are something, not because of what we do, but because of what he has done. We are, we are accepted because of what he has done. We are secure because he holds us in his hands. And we are significant because he's given us a life purpose. But that's not the end of the story, if you like. That's just a starting point. We've been made children of God. Today we move on to choosing to believe the truth. If we're looking for anchors in our faith, the first is who am I? Who am I in Christ? But what happens then? Do I just go back to everything that I already know and do? See, our culture has a bit of a drama. We, we tend to be triggered. Have you heard that word lately? Trigger warning. I'm about to say something that you're not going to like. Hmm. We're so easily reactive. We're so easily triggered. We're so driven by an emotional response to something that's happened. Hopefully something quite, not, quite, not quite that expensive. That would, be a, that would be an extreme end of the trigger warning there. But it could happen. I heard someone this week was triggered by a Facebook post that just really set them off. It can happen. We're so driven by our emotions. We can be driven by other things. I have the best dad in the world. Who said that? Who, who, it wasn't him. Did he say it? No, someone behind him said it. Yeah, I have the best dad in the world. I'll tell you why. Because he was, he was impulsive one day. And he went to Big W and he saw this games machine on sale. And we were probably, I don't know, 10, 12 at the time. And he brought it home on impulse. And the whole house erupted with joy. Woo! -hoo! You know, we set it up. Mum wasn't home. <laughs> so, so we set it up and we were playing this game. And, and, and it, was, it was impulse buying at its best. 
until mum got home. <laughs> and, and of course, one of the things that happens with impulses is after the impulse is over and you get the great kudos from, oh, wasn't I wonderful, best dad in the world, oh, it wasn't in the budget. And this isn't in our plan. And so it had to go back. But for two days, he was the best dad in the world. <laughs> Do you remember that? I remember. Do you remember it? He don't really shake his head. He's like, oh, I can't believe you told that story. <laughs> okay. Usually I ask permission before I tell stories like that. But anyway, I did. He'll, just, he'll catch me later. So, so impulse, impulse buying. We're, 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 we've been triggered by impulse buying. Yes, we can be triggered by impulse eating. Some of us are going to have to resist the urge to impulse eating today. Being Mother's Day, I'm sure many of you mothers might receive an oversupply of chocolate. And so the impulse to eat... The problem with some of these impulses is that they have lasting impact. Some of them can take a long time to resolve. For instance, overeating on chocolate. You know, that might take you a few weeks to, to work your way back from. But there are other things that take even longer to resolve. Other impulses, other making decisions based on faulty information that can lead to long-lasting, life-changing consequences. If you remember back to uh, Saddam Hussein and the war on Iraq... Now, I'm not actually arguing for whether this was a justified war or not, um, but what I will say is that the evidence that was given was that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, and that was the impulse that required the, the, the Americans and their allies to take preventative action to make sure that Saddam Hussein and the people of Iraq did not use these weapons of mass destruction on their own people or, or elsewhere. And as we well know, it triggered a war, and the war lasted for quite some time. And the whole time they were in the country, they were looking for these weapons of mass destruction. And with all of the searching, all of the time they were in the country, all of the, all of the extent to which they went looking for these weapons of mass destruction, as of yet, none have ever actually been found. The closest they've come are chemical weapons of a non-weapon of mass destruction kind of level, terrible, bad, not justifying any of it, but just saying that sometimes we can make big, life-changing, potentially disastrous decisions on faulty information, on triggers, on emotion, and on whim. And as the people of God, is that the way we should be driven? You see, our culture has very much become driven by how we feel. We could take any number of issues today, but let's just momentarily touch on the one that's very common and we hear about it all the time, about gender. If I no longer feel like I'm a man, I can call myself a woman. Or if I am a woman who no longer feel like I'm a woman, I can call myself a man and expect others to do so. Now, I think we should care for people who have these strong sensations and feelings and love them deeply. But there is a challenge to us to change what we call true because of how someone feels. Of course, it doesn't just exist at that level. During the pandemic, there was a lot of, no, I don't feel like that's right. No, I don't feel like that's right. And we had opposite sides of what was a factual, evidential debate. People saying opposite sides of it, and, and we didn't know which way to go. There are lots of issues in society where we actually base what we do, even though we'd say it was on fact, largely on feeling. Conspiracy theories abound. I don't know whether you've heard the one about the moon landing didn't really happen, apparently. It's a, it's a conspiracy. Oh, is it true? Flat Earth. Have you noticed Flat Earth's been rising on the agenda again lately? We live in a Flat Earth. It's all a conspiracy. It's not true. What's true? How do we know? Where do we start? Well, one of the problems is 
that the silent generation, the boomers, some Gen Xs, we used to have a way of dealing with reality that started with the facts, we put our faith in the facts, and our feelings we expected to accommodate that story. What's true? Put our confidence in what's true and expect our feelings to accommodate that story. But a very modern way of thinking, nice sleek new train there, puts feelings at the front. How do I feel? I don't really feel about it. I don't really feel like it. And we put our faith in our feelings and we make the facts shift. We say it can't be true because it doesn't feel right. We say it's not right because it doesn't feel right. We say you can't say that because it doesn't feel right. That's fine and good in a world with no anchor. But there are some times in the world when we want an anchor. You know when we want an anchor? Surgery. Surgery is a time you don't want the, the surgeon to go off on a whim. You don't want him to go off on some tangent. You want him to deal with the actual problem, right? There's another time that it matters when you're crossing the street. It's you or the bus, right? It's not about how you feel at that moment, is it? It's about the fact. And if you don't respond correctly to the fact, you'll feel the bus momentarily. Only for a moment. <laughs> you'll, but you'll be testing some other theories really quickly. So, we have a problem, don't we? And I'm hoping that actually as we just go through a short uh, discussion this morning, we're going to see that living by faith is living the truth. But it's not just living the truth. It's living the truth of God. Living by faith is living the truth, but living the truth of God. So over the last few weeks, we've been asking the question, who am I? And we came to the conclusion that the scripture actually describes you at the start of every New Testament letter to a church. It describes you as a saint, as a holy one, set apart for God. Is that who you are? Oh, we haven't done a very good job yet. I spent four weeks on it. We haven't, haven't resolved that one. Is that who you are? Yes, yes, that's who you are. The Bible says that you are a saint, a separated one, a holy one set apart for God. So does God love you? You sure? Does God love me? Okay, does God love me more than you? You sure? But I'm shinier than you. I'm up here under the lights. I've got a special position. No. No, God doesn't love me more than you, does he? In fact, whether I'm better than you or not has nothing to do with it, does it? And yet, and I'm not better than you, by the way, because Max's laughing about that fact. So I wasn't actually implying that. I'm actually implying you're better than me and God loves you more than me. Okay, just in case. But he doesn't, does he? We know that God doesn't actually show favoritism, that he actually loves us all equally. In fact, we know God loves you and I because it's his character, because God is love. 1 John 4 verse 8 tells us. But something still has to shift because knowing God loves us and knowing that we are loved by God doesn't automatically transform us. We're not, whilst we're made instantly his child, whilst we're made instantly beloved, chosen, we're not instantly transformed. We have a lifelong process of transformation. The Bible calls it sanctification. And so we have a part to play in this holiness. We have to choose. 
we have to choose what we believe. What you believe is pivotal. Psychologists say you will act according to what you really believe. If you want to see what you really believe, look at what you do. Actually, Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 says that. Whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So who got it right first? Was it the psychologists or the Bible? Psychologists say you will only act according to what you truly believe. God said it all along. Was it true because the psychologist said it? Was it true because God said it or was it true? It's true. God showed us what was true. Psychologists have only just caught up with that fact. And now they're telling us that you will only act according to what you really believe. And they tell us, therefore, if you want to change how you act, you've got to change what you believe. Here's what Hebrews 11 verse 6 says. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. This is something we have to change about what we believe. You can't please God without faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, what is faith? What is faith? Well, I heard a, young, a story about a young boy who said, it's trying really hard to believe what you know can't happen. Is that faith? Trying really hard to believe... What, what can't happen? Well, I'd like to suggest another suggestion for faith this morning. Faith is finding out what is true and believing it. Just like psychologists caught up with what was true based on Proverbs 23 and believed it, faith is finding out what's really, really true and believing it. And you and I need to learn how to do this. We see in the story of 1 Samuel chapter 17, the story of David and Goliath. What do we see in this story? Well, you, you know the story. Well, David, the shepherd boy, sent off to see his brothers on the front lines of the war with the Philistines. And, and when he arrived, nothing was happening. Both sides of the armies were lined up, facing in towards one another, with a big gap in between, ready to go to battle. But they decided they didn't really want the bloodshed today. They thought instead what they'd do is, we'll both send out our champions. And so out comes the, the Philistine champion, a guy named Goliath, 11-footer, towering above every man on the, on the battlefield. A giant. Could well have been from the tribe of Anak, which goes back to Genesis 5. Sons of God and daughters of men and giants and heroes of old stuff, right? But, but nonetheless, he was a big fella and he was undefeatable in the eyes of the Israelite army. They were cowering before him. There was no one who would go and face him on the battlefield. And... In walks David. What are the Israelites saying? We can't defeat him. No one can do it. But you know what David says? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine to defy the armies of the living God? Who was seeing what was really true? See, David didn't just see Goliath. He saw the living God who had showed his faithfulness to him when he'd faced the lion and the bear. And he knew that he could trust in the living God as he faced this uncircumcised Philistine. And so what did David do? He went out with his sling and his stones and he knocked Goliath out and cut off his head and Israel was victorious but what the point I want to make is this we can all be like Israel we can all not see the truth who was really looking at the truth David or the Israelites we all need to see the real truth behind the story 
Hebrews 13 verse 7 says, Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. Some would say, well, I want faith like you. Actually, what we really want is faith in God. We don't want to do what they did. We want to believe what they believed. We want to believe what they said. Because if we don't get our beliefs right, this is on your outline, you can write the word beliefs in there, our actions won't be right. If we don't get our beliefs right, our actions won't be right. So we need to find out from God what is already true. Choose to believe it regardless of feelings because truth is truth even if we don't believe it. Here's a thing that Jesus spoke a lot about. Jesus spoke a lot about hell. We don't speak a lot about hell. It's not my favourite topic. But you know there are Christians who don't believe in hell. I don't believe a good God would send people to hell. Well... Whether you believe it or not doesn't change whether it exists or not. And whether you believe it or not doesn't change the temperature one degree. If it's true, it's true whether you believe it or not. And so our job needs to be find out from God what is true and believe it. Because everybody lives by faith every action you take is based on faith you probably had this happen on the way here who came via car keep your hand up if you went through traffic lights in Beanley I feel sorry for you (laughs) traffic lights in Beanley the worst traffic lights right 12 minutes is that right Do you have to wait 12 minutes this morning? Maybe not on a Sunday, but during the week, 12 minutes to get through those traffic lights. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Uh, If you went through traffic lights today, you were stepping out in faith. You were stepping out in faith that when I go through the green, someone's not going to go through the red. They'll stop at the red. You're acting, in a sense, on faith. Think of another car analogy, and this happens to me a lot. When you go to the petrol pump and you, you fill the... The, the tank with gas and it comes out at $375 no it doesn't I'm over, over exaggerating but when you go into pay with your card because no one carries that amount of money on them to pay with your card you're operating in faith that the money that you know that you've got in the account is going to actually work when you go to the teller and there's a very terrible fin- sensation when it says transaction declined we all operate in levels of faith, don't we? I don't highly recommend getting, going to one of the places that would cost you $375 to fill the tank. That's a little excessive. Let's say I thought, hey, I believe I could pedal a, a plane across the ocean, fly across the ocean in a plane. I set it all up. I get myself ready. I start to pedal. Am I going to lift that plane off the ground? No. It doesn't matter how much faith I have in that. It's stupid. It's not going to work. It's not true. It's not doable. It's not reality. I can't pedal a plane across the ocean. It makes no difference how much faith I have in it. So the question we have to ask is, what I believe actually true? See, everyone believes in something. The question is who or what we believe in. There's another story in the Old Testament in 1 Kings 18 of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. I I loved this story growing up. You know, it's one of those ones that they have to censor when they tell in Sunday school. Are the kids out at kids' church? Good, I can tell the bloodthirsty version. Okay, so, so what happened was the people of Israel had devolved into the worship of idols in particular this god Baal and the queen Jezebel and king Ahab and and Elijah was sent to engage it was aggressive negotiations 
Because what actually happened was they come up with another contest. And, and, and Elijah said, well, look, let's, let, let's see who's the winner here. If, if, if God is God, if Yahweh is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. Decide, don't, don't stand of two opinions here. Make your mind up. But let's test it. Let's call on God. And so he, he sets up this test and he says, what we're going to do is we're going to set up two altars. You set up your altar, I'll set up my altar. You put your sacrifice, I'll put my sacrifice. We'll call down fire from heaven. And the God who, who answers with fire, he's God. And so what happens is the prophets of Baal win the toss and they get to go first. And so they start, they, they put their altar together, they put their sacrifice on the altar and they start calling out to their God, Baal. And they're saying, send fire, Baal, send fire, Baal. And then they start to, to dance and chant, send fire, Baal, send fire, Baal. No answer. And so they start to cut themselves with the tips of their spears so that blood's dripping, hoping that seeing the blood coming would, would get their God's attention. And they send fire, Baal, send fire, Baal. Nothing happens. And Elijah, being the um, politically correct person that he was, not starts to mock them and says where's your god where's your fire what's happened maybe he's asleep call out louder call out louder and so they send fire ball send fire ball calling out louder and louder and he says maybe he's gone away on a holiday send fire ball send... finally he says is he on the toilet it's in the text might not say those exact words. Nothing happens. Then comes Elijah's turn. Elijah walks out and prepares his offering and puts the, puts the sacrifice on the offering. And then, to all of the surprise of all the Baal worshippers, he gets buckets of water and pours it over the sacrifice, drenching it. If this thing catches a light, it'll be a miracle. And then he cries out to the Lord, send fire. And immediately, the sacrifice is burnt up. And the water and the stones consumed by the fire of God. So who had more faith? Who had more faith? Was it, was it because Elijah had more faith that his sacrifice was, was taken up and, and the Baals wasn't? No, it wasn't. In fact, we don't know who had more faith. Maybe the prophets of Baal had lots more faith, but they were believing in something that didn't exist. Baal is not real. So they were putting all their faith and confidence in something that didn't exist. So maybe they had lots more faith, maybe they didn't. It doesn't actually matter how much faith you have. It matters who or what your faith is in. It doesn't matter how much faith you have if what you believe isn't true. Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus said, I assure you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. It's not our power that moves the mountain. It's not the scope or extent of our faith that makes the difference. What makes the difference? Who our faith is is in are we trusting in something that is true are we trusting in something that is real have we pursued what is really true and put our faith and confidence in it Hebrews 13 verse 8 says and actually someone quoted it this morning it might have been Jim Jesus we thank him for being the same yesterday today and forever you want to know what's true start with something unchanging Jesus the same yesterday today 
and forever. And you know, the scripture tells us that he holds us in the palm of his hand. Let's start with an anchor for the soul. Jesus is true. In fact, he said it of himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the definition of truth. If you want to know what you can put your faith in, start with Jesus. So you might say, well, how do I grow my faith? How do I increase my faith? How can I have more faith? Well, when Eli was young, he was a a thrill seeker. Actually, nothing's changed. He's still a bit of a thrill seeker. But I could do any, I'd throw him up in the air and he'd say, more, 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 as I'd throw him up in the air. And this, you probably don't remember because you were like so small that you were, but he, he just wanted more, more, more of getting thrown up in the air. And, and you know, he, if I stood him on a table and I said, jump, he'd jump and I'd catch him. And then we'd say, all right, let's jump. And he'd jump and I'd catch him. No, I wouldn't go back that far. But whilst ever I caught him, he had confidence to jump. And this is how our faith grows. Through small steps of trusting in God with the promises of God and the truths of God, we learn to trust him in bigger steps. Through the things that have happened in the past where we've seen God be true to his word, It gives us confidence in the future. Faith grows when we take truth, put it into practice, and discover that it works. I'll say that again. Faith grows when we take truth, put it into practice, and find out that it actually works. In the book of Joshua, when Israel crossed the Jordan. I don't know whether you remember this story or not, but they had to cross the Jordan. And he sent the the Levites out first and they, they stood with the Ark of the Covenant and they stood in the water. And all of a sudden, the waters divided and the people of of Israel were able to walk through on dry land. And the command was given, set up 12 stones, one for each of the tribes, Make a monument, a memorial. We call it a can, C-A-I-R-N, a can. And the idea of this monument, this memorial, this, this, this pile of stones was in 20 years' time, when a new generation is coming through and they walk past those stones, they'll say, hey, Dad, hey, Mum, what's with the stones? And that will be your opportunity to remind them of what God has done in the past so that you can put confidence in him in the future. When we put trust in God's truth and see that it works, it builds our faith for now. Don't start with what you feel. Start with truth. When we look back and see what God has done, Let it build your faith for now. You see, we don't feel our way into good behavior. We actually start by doing what God says and behaving our way into good feelings. The final thing I want to suggest is that we need to put that faith in action. Faith is demonstrated by action. I don't know whether you realize this or not, but but the words for faith, trust, and believe, in the original language, they're the same word. So it's, it's good that um, w- once you understand that faith, trust, and believe are the same word in the original language, because sometimes we might use the word faith or believe and not realize that it also means trust. Do I trust this chair? I have good reason to trust this chair. I haven't seen any of these ones collapse. It's made of sturdy stuff. I can see the metal. I can see the padding. But actually, until I sit on it, I haven't put faith in it. Until I rest in it, I haven't trusted it. 
until I take the act of lifting my feet off the floor, I don't actually believe in it. I just know about it. And what the scriptures encourage us to do is to put faith into action, to actually rest. James 2, 17 and 18 says, in the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. If you don't do it, what did it do? Someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith from my works. In other words, this is not about, well, I've got faith because look at me, look at me, I'm doing it. That's not what it's about. It's actually showing that there is a direct connection between what you believe and what you do. And if you don't do what you believe, you don't really believe it. Someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by works. What we do shows what we really believe. Let's just put it in another way. Let's say I wanted to catch a train to Cairns. And so these days what you would do is you would Google it or you would get on the app and you would look at, okay, when, when's the train departing to Cairns? Oh, yeah, how long does the train trip take? Yep, yep, okay, it's going to take me um, 16 hours. Okay, yep. Where does it stop on the way? Um, oh, what kind, of, what kind of seats are available? I could get a... Oh, look, I can get a sleeper. I can get a sleeper. I can get a... Oh, look, I can get a, a premium seat. They might have more space and go back, or I can get cattle class and sit very uncomfortably for 16 hours all the way to Cairns. But I never book the ticket and get on the train. Faith acts on what it knows. It, it rests on what it knows. It responds to the truth. It doesn't just say it, it does it. If you want to know what you really believe, look at what you do. Faith grows when we put it into practice. And for most of us, it actually grows through what you might call challenging times. In difficult times, we grow the most. It might be a health concern. It could be a finance issue. Perhaps you have family concerns. My faith has grown over the last four years. My faith has grown considerably to trust in God for impossible things. As a pastor, we and our family have perhaps more attention than everybody else in the church. My kids have grown up in a, in a Christian home, attending church, always under the spotlight. And I've always tried to protect them from being under the spotlight. I've always tried to protect them from having to be considered as, you know, it's more important that you behave than the other children. But about four years ago, I had reason to become desperate. One of my children had said to me, I don't like your God. I hate your God. I don't believe in your God. I don't want anything to do with your God. Leave your God from me. And as you can imagine, I, I ached inside about that. I was like, what am I going to do how can I fix this? And about that time, a group of us were going through a course called Master Life. And Master Life had at the end of it a prayer retreat. A prayer retreat was a time where you just spend about four hours just sitting with the Lord and listening to what he says to you in prayer. Now, I'm not an expert on hearing the voice of God, but I can tell you that day I did. And, and as I prayed and sought the Lord, what do I do about my son? God said to me, do you think I need your help? I, what? I had this strong impression, do you think I need your help to save your son? I'm like, well, of course you need my help to save my son. He's my son. I'm his father. I'm his 
key influence. I'm his disciple. I'm the one who's taught him from birth about the things of God. And God said again, do you think I need your help? Now, usually when God says something repeatedly, it means you're getting the answer wrong. So I said, all right, Lord, well, what do you mean? And he said, how many people do I have around your son? I thought about it for a while and prayed about it and realized that he had people placed around my son, but I still wasn't convinced. I still wasn't certain. And then he prompted me further. Survey the book of Acts and tell me one person who was saved through the influence of their father. Now, I probably already knew the answer in advance, but I kind of started to go through the book of Acts and just just seeking before the Lord, you know, Lord, lead me on this. What are you trying to tell me? The closest I came was the jailer whose family was saved when um, when the, the prison doors opened and the and the apostle called out, don't, don't do anything, he was going to kill himself, don't do anything, we're still here. And that night, he and his whole family were baptised and saved. But it wasn't actually through the influence of the Father, it was through the mighty work of God testifying in front of the people. And I said, all right, God, I'm getting your point. What do you want me to do? And then I got this very strong impression of a tap being turned off. I really sensed God saying, turn off the tap. Don't provide any more guidance to your son about spiritual things. Leave it to me. I'm like, whoa, that's outside of conventional wisdom. I'm not recommending this to you unless God tells you. And if God does tell you this, come and talk to me about it. We'll check to make sure it's actually God and not just some random idea that's come from Jabin. But God said to me, turn off the tap. Stop telling him about me. So for about two years, I completely severed any spiritual guidance towards my son. Out of obedience to Christ, he'd get in the car and I'd be listening to something, Christian radio or whatever, I'd turn it off. If I was listening to a podcast, I'd I'd turn it off. He'd ask, oh, how was church? I'd say, you don't really want to know. He'd ask, oh, what's going on here or there? And I'd say, oh, you're not interested. And after about two years of this, we were driving along one day and I turned turned off the radio and he recognised, I think he caught on what I was doing. I mean, after two years, it was probably obvious. And he said to me, um, he says, Dad... You know how I said I don't really believe in God? He said, I really do. He said, just don't like him very much. He said, I know you and mum aren't idiots. You wouldn't believe in something that wasn't true. And and, and for me, that was like, is this a confirmation, God? Am I able to start talking to him about about you yet? And God said, nope, not yet. So I left it longer. This is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Just ask my family how hard it is for me not to talk to them about God. <laughs> but, I, but I didn't... I, 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 I tried to put my faith into action by doing what I sensed God had told me to do. And after about another year, or maybe six, six, six or eight months or so, my son came to me and said that he and his, his girlfriend had been um, reading the scriptures, the book of Revelation, and they, they wanted me to do a study with them on the book of Revelation. And I sent up a quick prayer to say, is this it, Lord? And the Lord said, yes. I said, well, I don't think we'll do Revelation straight away. <laughs> it's probably not the best place to start. Why don't we do Christianity Explained? So we sat down and put together a group and all of a sudden this is where the the current or or the, the the development of the young adults ministry that we now have began with my son asking would we study the scriptures with him well three weeks ago my son was baptized right here and at conference last week when I was away at conference I was praying to the Lord about this 
sense of hearing God's word and had he spoken to me and had I understood correctly. And I really sensed him say, well, did I do it? And I sat and thought about it for a minute and thought, yeah, he did. And my faith in being obedient to what God says to do has been built by what God has done in my son as I stepped out in obedience to him. And I want to challenge you to do the same. Faith is not just something you know. Faith is not just something you say you believe. Faith is something you step out and do. And as you do it, your faith will grow. We need to know what is true. We need to choose to believe and then we need to act on it. James 1 verse 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. 1 Kings 18 verse 21 said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Choose you this day who you will serve. Just as scientists hypothesize to come up with tests that they can do to work out what's false so they can believe what's true, so too can we as we build a can, a memorial, a reminder of what God has done in our small faith steps in the past to encourage us to take greater faith steps in the future. Amen? We can put the promises of God to the test. Do you know how we put the promises of God to the test? By believing them and acting on them in faith. Romans 4.17 speaks about Abraham. It says, He believed in God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. The ultimate truth in life is the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is the beginning of wisdom, but you can know about God and not be stepping out in faith. And so our challenge today is are we prepared to stand upon the promises of God? And around about that time that all this was happening with my son, who I'm sure you've all worked out is Eli, and he said I could tell the story. I wrote this song I'd like to share with you. Just as it gave me faith and confidence at that time that was very challenging, I pray that maybe it might give you faith and confidence today as well. has failed I don't do the things I want and sin has prevailed when my soul is weary and my heart is weak instead of a song of joy I can hardly speak well I need some help to get through this day I need to know the answers need to know how to pray that's when you 
your presence is near standing on your promises i need not a world with no more struggle and strife. You promise peace. You promise rest. Life in your presence is better than best. You promise joy and hearts filled with thanks. No flow of living water never quenched. You promise life abundant and full as we abide in you. him every word he says is true and so the question is today are you going to stand on his promises stand on his truth walk in his light walk in his life put your faith into practice the first anchor is who am I in Christ I'm accepted I'm secure I'm significant the second is God is the ultimate source of truth. And if we want to have a life that's abundant and full, we have to walk in faith, standing upon him. So how do we combat how do we combat our feelings? When our feelings are overwhelming and telling us how to feel, how do we combat that? I'm asking Peter to come and share these with us as we close this morning. We've got 20 short truths that can combat the flesh and the spirit and our feelings that we can anchor our lives to. These are called the 20 cans of success. We're going to read them together. Thanks, Peter, for leading us through that. Why should I say I can't when the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength? Why should I lack when I know that God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Why should I fear when the Bible says, God has not given me a spirit of fear, 
but of power, love and of sound mind. Why should I lack faith to fulfil my calling, knowing that God has allotted to me a measure of faith? Why should I be weak when the Bible says that the Lord is the strength of my life and that I will display strength and take action because I know God? Why should I allow Satan supremacy over my life when he is that is with me is greater than he that is in the world? Why should I accept defeat when the Bible says that God always leads me to triumph? Why should I lack wisdom when Christ became wisdom to me from God and God gives wisdom to me generously when I ask for it? Why should I be depressed when I can recall to mind God's loving kindness, compassion and faithfulness and have hope? Why should I worry and fret when I can cast all my anxiety on Christ who cares for me? Why should I be, be in bondage, knowing that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom? Why should I feel condemned when the Bible says, I am not condemned because I am in Christ? Why should I feel alone when Jesus said, he is with me always, and he will never leave me nor forsake me. Why should I feel accursed, or that I am a victim of bad luck, when the Bible says that Christ redeemed me from the curse of the law, that I might receive his spirit? Why should I be discontented when I, like Paul, can learn to be content in all circumstances? Why should I feel worthless when Christ became sin on my behalf that I might become the righteousness of God in him? Why should I have persecution complex knowing that nobody can be against me when God is for me? Why should I be confused when God is the author of peace and he gives me knowledge through his indwelling spirit? Why should I feel like a failure when I am a conqueror in all things through Christ? Why should I let the pressures of life bother me when I can take courage knowing that Jesus has overcome the world and its tribulations? Remember, it's not the size of our faith. It's what our faith is in. It's who our faith is in. I'll get the musicians to come up.
Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. 